welcome to this uh, lecture in the course of Investment Banking and Structured Finance. Uh, this lecture will be dedicated to, uh, in a certain sense, a new topic inside this course. So far we have analyzed the industrial side of the deal. We have started next time uh, to analyze uh, the flow chart that the arranger uses in order to identify which is the best mix between debt and equity and so to identify when a project finance is viable from the financial point of view. The point now becomes uh, once you have identified a suitable debt to equity ratio for your project, which are exactly the funding alternatives that sponsors have available in order to fund the project. So at the very end, today's lecture is focused on the sources of financing for a project finance transaction. Most things we have already seen in the past lectures will be recovered and will be dealt in more depth. Basically what I would like to do with you is to analyze the different alternatives that sponsors have available in order to fund the project. Alternatives for funding. Uh, since project finance is basically the financing of a specific venture that is incorporated, that is uh, uh, encapsulated in one special vehicle, there should be any particular difference between a standard capital structure in a firm and the capital structure of a project. And at the very end, what we will see this afternoon and tomorrow is basically the fact that the special purpose vehicle has a balance sheet where on the left hand side we will see the investment plus all the capitalized costs that uh, have been incurred by the special purpose vehicle during the construction phase and on the liability side basically uh, the split between the two basic sources of funding the one is that and the other one is equity What I will try to do this afternoon is to analyze the specific agreements that the special purpose vehicle signs with banks and sponsors in order to get the amount of money that is necessary to fund the project. In particular, uh, uh, one special feature that the special purpose vehicle experiences during the life is that between debt and equity, there is another possibility to fund the project that is, in a sense, intermediate between debt and equity, and that this alternative source is represented by subordinated debt. Subordinated debt uh, is basically word, says it, a debt, but since this debt is subordinated, creating a subordination for this debt makes the special purpose vehicle in the condition to pay cash flow at different levels for different seniority of debt. Basically, th this means that if I have free cash flow, I will first reimburse capital and interest on the first seniority lending, so the senior debt, I will define it as a senior debt, and then I will repay interest and capital on the subordinated debt. If you want, put differently, uh, the subordinated debt can be repaid only and only if the senior loan has been fully repaid. Okay? Talking about debt and talking about equity, we will have to deal with some specific features uh, related to project finance. I will start with equity, and in particular, starting with equity, I will analyze uh, such points. The first one, uh, it is important to know uh, when equity will be contributed. Because if I know the amount of equity that will be contributed into the special purpose vehicle, it is also important for the arranger to understand when, I mean at which point in time, equity will be contributed. And so the first look uh, must be paid to the so-called equity contribution agreement. That is, the agreement between the special purpose vehicle and its sponsors as to 
how much equity to provide to the vehicle and at what time to provide it. The second uh, aspect, the second topic I will deal talking about equity is the so-called uh, standby equity agreement. Uh, that is a special feature of a project finance that must be analyzed uh, in great care. Standby equity agreement. Talking about that, uh, the relevant points that must be stressed analyzing the capital structure of uh, the project finance is basically uh, this set of points. The first one is we are talking about debt, but we have already seen that debt means nothing in project finance. Uh, I talked to you in one of our past lectures that loans are crunched, are differentiated according to the different cost items that this debt must cover. And so the first problem I will uh, analyze and I will return very quickly is the tranching system in project finance. Tranching system. The second point, uh, very quickly, will be uh, the structure, if you want, the structure of the facility. I mean uh, timing of uh, contribution and timing of repayment. So we will have to analyze basically which are the alternatives that are available to the special purpose vehicle in order to repay the loan. If you want, it is the problem of loan repayment schedules. We will see that there are different alternatives to set up this uh, repayment schedule. And uh, the key point for an arranger is to identify a proper capital repayment that matches properly with the dynamics of the free cash flow in order to assure that every year the disequation cash available is higher than cash needed. And so this disequation is satisfied. Okay? So we have four points uh, to take into consideration. Let's start with the first two, talking about equity. Talking about equity is quite easy because equity is not the most relevant part into the capital structure of a special purpose vehicle. We have already seen that uh, uh, project finance is a very highly leveraged transaction. So the amount of equity that is contributed by sponsor is a thin amount compared to the heavy amount of loans that are charged on the special purpose vehicle. Basically, we have seen that two sponsors, for example, A and B, contribute equity to the special purpose vehicle. And this contribution is regulated under the uh, equity contribution agreement. So when sponsors contribute equity to the special purpose vehicle, these two arrows indicate exactly two contracts, basically. And these contracts are defined as equity contribution agreements. So these are equity contribution agreements. Uh, what uh, is included in such equity contribution agreement? Uh, this equity contribution agreement will certainly include uh, very simple information. The first one is the total amount of equity that must be contributed. The second point that is much more relevant uh, in the negotiation between sponsors and lenders is uh, the timing of contribution. And so the distribution of cash injections by equity holders during the construction phase of the project. So the total amount, the schedule of contribution. Just to make things simple, <coughs> let's assume a very simple example. Suppose that uh, you have a project that, whose value is a value of 1,000. Suppose that 
based on our financial assumptions and based on our financial model, we have identified a proper capital structure that includes a contribution of 85% debt and the remaining 15% equity. Okay? So, you have seen, based on our assumptions and based uh, on uh, the uh, inputs of the financial model, that this combination between debt and equity is financially viable. I mean, cash available every year is sufficient to repay capital and interest. Uh, it follows from this that the equity contribution agreement will identify that the total amount that will be contributed by sponsors will be 50% times the value of 1,000 or 150. It is very simple. The next problem, much more difficult to solve, is exactly to identify when the equity contributors will provide equity. And uh, according to your opinion, which can be the different alternatives that the arranger can set up with the sponsors in order to provide equity capital to the project? Which are? Okay, the first basic option is to ask sponsors to provide all the equity, a part, obviously, from the minimum capitalization required for the setup of a, a limited partnership or a corporation in Italy. Uh, the amount is 120,000 euros for a corporation or 10,000 euros for a limited liability. So apart from this minimum capitalization, all the equity will be provided only at the end of the construction period. Only after the total loans provided by lenders have been completely exhausted, been used. Okay? So, the first alternative is, first option, provide equity only when the total amount of funds provided by banks has been completely exhausted. You use all the money provided by banks and only after that you contribute equity. Okay? So, everything after the loans. Obviously, uh, this is certainly good news for sponsors because you know that in an investment, as long as starting from time zero, you are able to postpone cash outflows, all things equal, if the project starts producing cash flows in the future, and I, can, and I can postpone my cash outlay, my cash disbursement, very far in the future, the internal rate of the, the, internal rate of return of the deal should improve. Okay? In finance, one basic principle is try to anticipate all the cash inflows and try to postpone at the top, at, at most, the cash outlays. Okay? So this is certainly good news for sponsors. It is not certainly good news for lenders. Uh, suppose that lenders are particularly reluctant to accept such kind uh, of uh, uh, agreement with lenders, which is the opposite alternative that you can negotiate with lenders in order to, uh, you know, get very quickly the amount of money from equity holders. Very simple. Provide all the equity immediately, right before you use all the funds provided by banks. It is exactly the opposite direction. Okay? So the second alternative is all equity at the beginning of the project, all the equity at the beginning, and above all, before using the loan. I mean, banks say, I will not provide you any amount of money unless you have provided all the equity you are engaged to provide into the project, so 150, okay? Third option, can we identify, in a sense, an alternative that mutually satisfied uh, both lenders and sponsors? 
Suppose, for example, do you certainly, you certainly remember the example of the cogeneration one. Cogeneration one has a construction period of 40 months. Okay? And during those 40 months, uh, the special purpose vehicle will pay the contractor some down payments for, uh, you know, the advancement of the construction. The alternative can be very simple. Every time the special purpose vehicle must pay something for the construction, this payment will be partially financed with equity and partially financed with debt using the same proportions of the capital structure. So 85% loan and 15% and equity. Okay? It is very simple. This is the so-called pro rata clause. So mm. the pro rata means that every payment must be financed with the same proportion of debt and equity as stated into the capital structure. Okay? So 2.3 is the pro rata clause. Suppose, for example, that I have four installments for the payment of this amount of 1,000. Each of them is 250, for example. In this case, you agree that every time an amount of money whose value is 250 is required to pay the construction costs for the project, 15% will be financed with equity, and the remaining 85% is paid through debt. Namely, the 15% times 250 is 37.5, and the remaining amount will be 250 minus 37.5, and so an amount of 212.5. This is a sort of, you know, you can imagine as a sort of compromise between the need of the sponsors to postpone at most the cash outlays and the legitimate need of lenders to be, in a sense, guaranteed by the fact that a strong commitment by sponsors is assured for all the construction period. Okay? If you want, we can see this simple example uh, in this way, you have this one in your slides, so you can simply follow this scheme. Here I have identified three possible options for this project whose amount is 1,000. Uh, this uh, amount of 1,000 is paid in four installments. Each of them is 250. You can see it in the third column under the heating payments. And you see that the payments are the same in all the three different alternatives. Okay? So in four years, you pay four down payments to your suppliers of uh, the building, uh, the facilities, and uh, so on and so forth. The first alternative is the pro rata contribution. So from the point of view of a financial modeler, what the financial model will show you is that you certainly remember that during construction, the free cash flow is simply capex because we don't have any positive cash flow. So the free cash flow will be the amount of cash that must be disbursed, the capital, the, 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 the capital expenditure. So we will see minus capex for an amount of 250. And if we use a pro rata clause, every year my cash flow will experience what you see in the first two columns. The first column will uh, indicate that this amount of capex will be financed, and so the positive sign of the cash flow, because it is a financing flow, and so cash comes inside the special purpose vehicle. 212.5 new debt contribution, so we will have new debt contribution. 212.5. And then another positive financing flow uh, determined by equity contribution agreement, whose amount is 37.5. New equity. 37.5. And obviously, the final cash flow of the project closes to zero. OK? 
cash outlays are completely offset by cash contributions. And uh, interest on uh, the amount of debt that is used starts to be capitalized until the end of year number four. So on the first use in year one, 212.5, we will have at the end of the construction period three years of capitalized interest. At the end of year one, I use funds, and I will capitalize interest on year two, three, and four. On the second installment of uh, used funds, I will capitalize the interest for two years, between year two and year four. On the third use of funds, I will capitalize the interest for one year. And so the total amount to be repaid will be certainly not the original amount of loans, 850, but much more. The amount of interest plus all capitalized interest. Remember this important aspect. Okay? So the total amount to be repaid will not be the principal amount, but principal amount plus all capitalized interest. Okay? Let's move on column number four. Initial contribution. Suppose that, uh, for any reason, sponsors uh, are forced by lenders to contribute all the equity at the beginning of the project. Because, for example, their bargaining power is very weak. Okay? And so banks uh, uh, are in a position to require immediately the contribution of equity. You see that the dynamics of cash flow changes. Because during the first year, uh, lenders provide only a minimum amount of cash. The amount is 100, because the largest part of funds is provided immediately by equity contributors. You can see immediately that the amount is placed for the whole amount, 150, at the beginning of year one. Obviously, from uh, this point on, it is uh, uh, no more required, more equity, zero, zero, zero. And the lenders will provide the amount of 250, 250, 250 for all the remaining three years. Total amount returns the, uh, the value of 850 again, and the amount of equity is 150 again. Okay? Sufficiently clear for you? Look, it is very simple. The first branch is financed for the total amount of equity at the very beginning, and as a complement between 250 of payments and 150 of equity contribution, it is 100 provided by banks. And starting from here, 2, 3, and 4, they contribute the total amount to be correspondent to the amount of payments. So 250 will be provided by banks, by banks, and again by banks. Very easy. Uh, look and compare the two scenarios. There are two offsetting effects in the perspective of a shareholder. Look at the first option. For sure, if we look at the perspective of an equity holder, his payoff in terms of calculation of internal rate of return will be something like this. At the end of year one, I provide some capital. Year number two again. Year number three again. Year number four again. Okay? So, I can dilute part of my contributions during all the four years. In the first option, I see that starting from time zero, the equity contribution is concentrated for the whole amount on the first year for the entire amount of 150. Uh, in your opinion, uh, which are uh, the effects of anticipating all the equity contribution to time zero. I have a negative effect in terms of IRR, but I have also one positive effect. Can you identify it? And the financial model can give me the solution as to which of the two effects is, is the dominant one. Look at the first scenario. You can postpone contributions during the years. But on the other hand, starting from the first year, you use a larger amount of loan. Look, in the first year you use 212.5 against the first year of the second option you use only 100. In terms of interest capitalization, 
which will be the most interesting alternative for sponsors in terms of the second one because in the second one I start capitalize the interest only on an amount of 100 instead of in the first solution a capitalization of on 212.5 but on the other hand you contribute immediately in this case a whole amount of 150 and so you have an co opportunity cost in terms of lost return on alternative investment that you have to consider when calculating the internal rate of return and the internal rate of return will exactly tell you that the total amount must be contributed right now so you have two opposite effects uh, when you use a pro rata you can postpone contributions in the future but you start immediately using cash from banks and this generates a um, capitalization of interest on the other hand as long as you anticipate the amount of equity contribution you can exactly save part of the capitalized interest that are required on the funds used from banks which of the two is the most relevant effect will be calculated by using a financial model that will tell you exactly which of the two alternatives will show you as a shareholder a right payoff. I don't know if it is sufficiently clear. I have two counterbalancing effects. Finance tells me to postpone payments, but on the other hand, since we are not a functioning firm, we are a project finance, we start capitalizing interest and we have to consider this effect. Sufficiently clear? Any question? Look at the final option. The final option is uh, uh, the contribution of equity exactly at the end, when all the debt has been completely exhausted. Look, we have to contribute 850 in terms of debt, and 850 is exactly used from the very beginning. So I start financing payments for the total amount with debt, with the in year one, in year two, and in year three. In year four, I have still 100 euros of loan to be used, and I will use it. And I will complement this amount of 100 with the remaining amount of funds from shareholders, 150. The reasoning we made in terms of saving of capitalized interest in this scenario is exactly reverted you have benefited from the complete postponement of equity contribution until year four but you have to take into consideration that the amount of capitalized interest will be the highest of the three alternatives because I have used 250 of loans start from the very beginning okay sufficiently clear for you sufficiently clear good uh, so Remember, equity contribution agreements must uh, uh, include rules about the total amount of loans and particularly the timing where loans will be contributed. The other uh, inclusion into the equity contribution agreement is uh, the so-called standby equity agreement. That is an add-on to the contract that is always uh, required by lenders. Let's see what exactly standby equity means. Standby equity. Suppose, just to uh, go on with this example, 1,000 of project value financed 80% with debt and 15% with equity. And suppose that banks as uh, I will show you in a couple of minutes, agree to provide you 850 of what I call a base loan, a base facility, plus an additional amount of loans that can be used in order to cover some form of contingency. For Italians, uh, uh, contingency means eventi imprevisti, mm. unexpected events. Mm. It is important to provide some form of money in order to cover unexpected events. Suppose, for example, you remember a change in law. There is a change in regulation. You have to make some 
uh, changes in the original design of the project, and so you have to spend much more money. Okay? Suppose then uh, that, for example, banks agree to provide you what I call in a couple of minutes standby loan or standby facility. I mean a loan that is in standby, it is waiting until there is some form of unexpected event to be covered. If that unexpected event doesn't occur, the standby facility will never be used. Very simple. Okay? Plus standby facility. Plus standby facility covering 10% of project value. So the amount of funds that will be available in order to cover unexpected events will be an amount of 10% time, an amount of 100, and so uh, 1,000, and so 100. Obviously, when you negotiate a standby facility, uh, relating the standby facility with a percentage to the original amount of money that has been provided by either lenders or sponsors, you have to consider that supposing that the unexpected event occurs, suppose for example that there is an unexpected event whose amount creates an additional disbursement for the project whose value is, let's say, 50. Okay? So extra costs are 50. And so the final amount of financed money will be no more 1,000, but 1,050. Okay? In this case, uh, yes, I can use a standby facility of um, up to an amount of 100. But if I use only a standby facility, and so if I cover this extra cost, only resorting to the amount of standby equity, a standby facility, so, sorry, I will alter the ratio between debt and equity. It is obvious, because I will use 850 plus 50 is uh, uh, 900, and 900 over 1050 is no more 85 over 15. For this reason, when banks negotiate a standby facility into the debt package, they require the inclusion into the equity contribution agreement of the so-called standby equity, meaning that every time an unexpected cost arises, this extra cost must be financed again, partially with debt and partially with equity, that is, in standby until an unexpected event occurs. And the proportions that will be used will be exactly the proportion of debt and equity originally agreed between sponsors and lenders. This means that if extra cost of 50 incurs, I will use 85% covered with the standby facility provided by banks. And the remaining 15% will be provided by shareholders in force of the shareholder standby equity agreement. Okay? If you don't include the standby equity clause and some unexpected events occur, the original debt equity ratio will be altered. And this is not fair. Okay? I don't know if it is clear. 15% under the standby equity agreement. Have you got it? Sufficiently clear? Any question about the concept of standby equity? Standby equity means you don't have to provide me additional equity now, but you will do when an expected event arises, and as long as banks are open to finance this additional extra cost, 
you must be open to provide new money. No more and no less than the exact original proportion between debt and equity. It is quite fair in this sense. And that's why banks include also such kind of patient money. It is there, it is waiting, and maybe if this unexpected event doesn't occur, this money will never be used by either banks or shareholders. Okay? Sufficiently clear? Very easy. Hmm? Good. Apart from these uh, uh, caveats uh, about uh, the contract for the contribution of equity, I have no more to say about uh, equity contributions in project finance. Much more interesting is to have a look uh, at uh, the debt side of the deal in order to see something more interesting for our purposes. So, looking at the debt, <coughs> We have seen that there are two basic aspects to be negotiated uh, between sponsors and lenders. Uh, the first is the tranching system of the loan. We have seen that uh, loans are not uh, allowed to the special purpose vehicle only with one single loan. Uh, what we have seen, we have seen it uh, when talking about syndication, is that loans are tranched, are allowed, are contributed based on specific items to be financed. Okay? And uh, the tranching system basically uh, includes uh, three types of facilities. The first one is uh, what usually uh, technicians call base loan or base facility. And uh, base loan and base facility uh, is the loan whose main purpose is to provide money, obviously, in the proportion that has been agreed between sponsors and lenders to finance the cost of investment, so the cost of the investment and all the additional costs that this investment determines during construction. And so capitalized interest, fees paid to lawyers, technical advisors, fiscal advisors and financial advisors, and so the cost for the investment, the startup costs, startup costs basically are represented by all the fees that has, have been paid by the special purpose vehicle to all the consultants that have helped sponsors to organize the deal. So startup costs, basically consulting costs. And then, uh, in order to finance uh, what I called uh, owner's costs, and so basically owner's costs, meaning honorary del proprietario, honorary della proprietà, owner costs, uh, basically owner costs are all ancillary facilities that must be added to the base facility. Take, for example, the case of cogeneration one. If Enel doesn't build the, uh, in the high voltage connection, you must also build this ancillary facility. And if you build a cogeneration facility that must be connected to the roads or the highways, you have to bear the cost of building a road for the access to the plant. So all the additional costs related to this project must be financed. These are called uh, technically owner's costs. So, our financial model will show us the total amount that is represented by the sum of these three items. And the financing of these three items will be split 85% with senior debt or base loan facility and uh, the remaining 15% percent 
will be financed with equity. Okay? Uh, base loan is also called a senior loan because uh, it is the loan that must be paid before any other loan can be repaid. So there isn't any other financial loan that has a reimbursement clause whose priority is higher than this one. This means basically that once I have paid all the operating costs, once I have set aside money in order to cover the change in working capital, the first item to be reimbursed are interest on the senior loan and the principal repayment on senior loan. Senior loan is paid before any other loan can be repaid. Okay? And second characteristic, but you have already seen it, the senior loan is fully guaranteed because all the assets of the vehicle are collateral for this loan. Do you remember? All the assets, the pledge on the shares of the SPV, the mortgage on the fixed assets, and the pledge on all the future credits that the special purpose vehicle has are all collateral for this loan. This loan is fully guaranteed. Okay? It is senior and it is fully, it is the term collateralized. Fully collateralized. Please, pay attention to one fact. You can collateralize everything. You can give any form of guarantee. But I remember you that the value of a non-performing power plant is zero. If you have a mortgage on a non-performing plant, the value of that guarantee is zero. So, remember that the loan is always fully guaranteed. But the market value of the guarantees in project finance, if the project is not performing, is close to zero. So it is not the relevant guarantee in project finance. The real guarantee in project finance are project contracts. Remember, the risk management. Second, financial package. Base loan covers the big piece of meat that uh, the project represents, for sure. But look again at our example. Here we have a project whose value is 1,000. And I have, I have already told you that uh, if you bear a cost of 1,000 in four years, during these four years you will receive four invoices by the contractor who will indicate an amount of 1,000 plus value added tax. And value added tax, unfortunately, can, cannot be matched with value added tax on sales because until year four, I don't have sales. And so, in my balance sheet, there will be a huge amount of credits toward the fiscal administration for value added tax. And this value must be again financed 85% with equity, uh, sorry, 85% with debt, and 15% with equity. But this debt is not represented by the base loan. It is represented by a second tranche that is called value at the tax loan or value at the tax facility. VAT facility. Value at the tax facility covers exactly the cash that is needed by the fact that the value of investment, the value of startup costs and donor costs are charged with value at the tax. And so you have to pay not only these three amounts of money, but also the value added tax relative to these three amounts. And that's why this value added tax facility should be more or less uh, the value added tax percentage times the value of investment, startup costs, and dollar costs. Without including, obviously, the complication of the fact that sometimes value added tax uh, uh, percentages can be different. But anyway, in a very simplified setting, the amount of the value-added tax facility should be the uh, multiplication of value-added tax times the value of these three items, plus investment, startup cost, 
and all those costs. One question for you, one question for you. It is very easy, I think, and quite intuitive. I will uh, certainly have uh, to solve the problem of uh, how to reimburse the base loan and base facility, and so I will have to set up a good uh, schedule repayment. Is it necessary to identify ex ante a schedule repayment for the value at the tax facility or not? Or it is, in a sense, automatic once the project starts the operation phase? I mean, the question is, I know that every time I use funds from banks, I will have to negotiate with banks a repayment schedule. I mean, what, uh, which amount I will pay you here by year uh, according to the evolution of cash flows. That's obvious, and I will return on this topic later on. For sure, also the value at the tax facility will have to be reimbursed. But in this case, do I have to fix a schedule repayment, or the schedule repayment is, in a certain sense, uh, derived directly from the development of the project? I don't know if you got the question. The question is very simple. Suppose that the value at the tax facility is, let's say, this amount is 1,000. Suppose that the value at the tax facility is 200. 20% 20 times the value of 1,000, okay? And suppose that you have arrived at year number four, when the total amount of value at the tax has been paid and uh, you have the total amount of credit included into the balance sheet of the special purpose bank. Now, suppose that in the next, let's say, three years, so in year number five, in year number six, and in year number seven, you have revenues coming from, let's say, uh, the sale of uh, steam and the sale of uh, energy, or traffic coming on the road, let's say of 50, 50, and 50, okay? Suppose that these three revenues of 50 included into the business plan are charged with a value added tax of 20%. And so, you will cash in a tier number five, a tier number six, a tier number seven, not an amount of 50, but an amount of 60. That is, 50 for the traffic plus 20% value added tax on these values because customers pay not only the, ta the tariff but also the value added tax on that. Okay? So, if every year between year 5, year 6, and year 7, I cash in an amount of 60, it is quite obvious that from this cash inflow, I will take the amount of value at the tax, whose value is 10, and this 10 can be used in order to repay the original amount of loan. It's like to say, you, special purpose vehicle, will collect every year a certain amount of revenue and a certain amount of value at the tax. The cash corresponding to the amount of value at the tax is used, is split between the other cash inflows, and it is used to repay the original amount of the value at the tax. Very simple. You, I don't know if you, uh, if you have got it. Tell me. Sufficiently clear? Question. It's exactly the question that I posed you before. It, it is exactly this, the problem. The problem is very simple. If the project performs very well, in a very short period of time, the schedule repayment will be very strongly accelerated because the amount of revenue is so powerful that you can recover quite easily the amount of cash in order to repay in the vet facility. But if the project starts up with a ramp-up period, I mean, 
it needs some time in order to get fully operated. The schedule repayment for the value at the tax facility can be also very long. Put it, put it differently. The schedule repayment will be based on the business plan. The business plan will, e will exactly indicate to you the amount of cash that based on future projection of revenues can be used in order to repay exactly your facility. Okay? So, what it is important to remember is unless base loan, base facility, and in a certain sense, standby facility, value add the tax facility as a reimbursement plan that is strictly connected to the performance of the project. The better the performance, the quicker the period the banks will experience in order to repay their loans back. Uh, the weaker the performance, the longer the period, they will get back their money. Okay? I don't know if you agree with me. Sufficiently clear? Good. Just one complication on this reasoning, and the complication is very simple. Uh, since uh, the value at the tax facility is uh, yielding interest rates to the banks, uh, the amount of 10 must be split every year in terms of interest and repayment. So, this amount of 10 will not be deducted as a rule from the amount of 200. Because you have to take into consideration that value added tax facility yields interest to banks. And so, in order to calculate the amount of loan that is repaid in year number five, for example, you have to make one simple additional calculation. And the additional calculation is this one. Suppose that the value added tax yields an interest rate of 10%. So every year you have to pay 10% interest rate. So I on value added tax is 10%. Since the interest is calculated on the outstanding amount at the end of the previous period, I know that the outstanding amount of loan at year number four is 200. And so interest on 200 is, uh, on a yearly basis, 200, the outstanding amount of loan, times the interest rate on loan, 10%, The value of interest is basically 10% of, uh, uh, in this case, 200 per times 20% is 20. In this case, paradoxically, this amount of 10 is used only to repay a part of the interest on the value at the tax. And so, no principal repayment is done. And the remaining part of interest rate will be paid by using all the remaining amount of funds that is provided by the special purpose vehicle. So, in year number five, look, you have generated value added tax whose amount is 20% times 50, the amount is 10. This amount of 10 should be split into the two components, payment of interest and payment of capital. Since the value at the tax facility produces in that year an amount of interest rate of 20, this amount of 10 is used immediately to repay the interest. The remaining amount of interest, namely the remaining 10, will be paid using all the other cash available from the project, and no capital repayment will be recorded during year number 5. Sufficiently clear for you? Remember, if... Uh, on the other hand, uh, in normal condition, we find a value of revenues that is larger than this one. Suppose, for example, that in year number five, you get a value of revenues of, let's say, 500. And so the value at the tax that is being cashed in on this value of 500 is 100. This 100 is used 20 in order to repay interest and the remaining amount of 80 
is used to repay the original amount of loan 20 and 80 which will be the final outstanding amount at the end of year number 5 the outstanding amount after one year the original amount of the loan has been 200 I have generated cash for 500 and value added tax by 100 100 has been split in 20 interest repayment and 80 capital repayment which is the outstanding amount at the end of year number 5 the amount of value added tax that, be, that must be reimbursed in year number 6 and year number 7 120 it is 200 the original amount minus 80 principal repayment and so 120 at the end of year number 5 sufficiently clear? the reimbursement is strictly connected to the performance of this project the better the performance the quicker the period the, wor the weaker the performance the longer the period clear for all? fine for all? good uh, the third debt that is included into the financial package is uh, uh, the and we have just seen it, the standby facility. The standby facility, that is the facility used to cover contingencies. Uh, remember that standby facility, unless this uh, unexpected event of cures, is not materially used by the special purpose vehicle. It is there. It is uh, in a sort of waiting that something happens. And until the standby facility is not used, basically I do not have to pay any form of interest in a comparison between the other two. Because if I use value added tax, I will have to pay interest. And if I use base loan, I will have to pay interest. Until value add, um, standby facility is not used, I will not pay interest. But anyway, I have to pay something. And you will certainly remember it. If I don't use a loan in a project finance setting, I don't pay interest, but I pay what? A commitment fee. So, as long as a standby facility is not used, standby facility is there, is available, but you anyway have to pay a certain amount of money, given the fact that the banks uh, have been open to provide you some form of safety cushion and sa that safety cushion costs to you and costs a commitment fee okay so here you don't have interest unless you use it but you anyway have to pay a commitment fee okay sufficiently clear very easy uh, so, the first problem was tranching system. The second problem, the second big problem that the financial model has to solve is uh, to identify a proper uh, schedule repayment. I mean, to identify a reimbursement of loan that, is, uh, that can be matched with the dynamics of the free cash flow in order to keep uh, the disequation validated. Cash available must be higher than cash needed. Uh, from your mathematical finance courses, you know that there are very numerous ways of uh, amortizing a loan. The Italian method, the French method, the Dutch method, the German method, and many, many more. The problem for project finance is that, unfortunately for you that studied heavy mathematical finance, is that such kind of schedule doesn't work do not work for a very simple reason suppose to consider the case of the French amortization French amortization means that every year you have to pay a fixed amount of money and that fixed amount is the sum of the principal amount and the interest amount and the sum of the two is fixed okay in this case uh, you are asking to your project to pay a certain amount of debt service 
where ds is the sum of capital repayment and interest repayment that is fixed throughout the life of the loan. Uh, suppose that your project during uh, the life of the loan, and supposing that n is the final repayment of the loan, shows a cash flow pattern of, let's say, this way. It is clear that a too rigid and excessively rigid schedule repayment is not suitable for project finance because in some years, for example, this one and this one, or maybe this one, I have uh, too much cash and uh, a good solution should be to repay much more amount of loans but there are some other years where this situation is not met this one, this one and particularly this one where it would be much more advisable to reduce the amount of loan repaid in order to maintain and to keep the disequation cash available, cash needed with a positive sign. I don't know if you got it. The idea should be that the debt service should be, uh, in a sense, adapted in a sort of this kind of behavior. This is a much better solution because a, solu a solution like this one allow me to keep a minimum difference every year between the cash available and cash needed. Okay? Quite easy. A sort of loan that repays different percentages of capital in different years is often called tailor-made schedule repayment. I mean, it is a customized schedule repayment. It is a schedule repayment that we require you to pay higher percentage of capital in years where cash is uh, really abundant and to pay a lower percentage of debt repayment in years where cash is particularly scarce. Okay? And so this is a so-called tailor-made schedule repayment. Just to give you an idea, just to give you an idea, uh, observe uh, one uh, of the examples that you have in your slides. And the slide is uh, this one. You have these calculations in your, in your slides, so you can simply follow on the screen. Look, here you have uh, basically uh, these columns that are of interest for you. Look uh, what I show you and how to read this table. This table show you uh, a debt amount, a loan amount uh, whose value is 1,000. On this loan amount, uh, lenders require the minimum debt service cover ratio of 1.3. Do you remember? I asked that the free cash flow is 30% more than the sum of capital and interest. You remember this from, past le from the past lecture? Okay. Uh, you see the amount of cash that is available for the project in all these semesters, semesters going from semester number zero to semester number 16, so eight years, eight years, in uh, the uh, column FCO. Uh, operating cash flow. Hmm? These are the cash flows that are generated by the business plan. Look at the column capital repayment percentage. You can easily see that a capital percentage repayment of 6.25% is uh, 
a standard amortization schedule that you have learned in your mathematical finance courses. Because if the capital repayment is fixed throughout the years, this is the Italian method of depreciation. The capital repayment is fixed. The interest are decreasing because every year you repay one part of the capital. And so this uh, depreciation schedule is an Italian depreciation. The capital that is repaid every year is fixed. It is 62.5. You can easily see from this. If you pay 6.25% plus 6.25%, so 12.5% in a year, you will depreciate your loan in eight years. Eight times 12.5 is 100. Okay? Look at the debt service cover ratio. The debt service cover ratio show results that are comforting because in many years you are much higher than the 1.30. Uh, you are 140, 45, 50, 60, 58. So the project seems reasonably well, performing reasonably well. But unfortunately, there are two years that are particularly close to the minimum. Which are these two years? Look at the debt service cover ratio column. Which are the weaker years in this project? Which are very simple. The first two. The first two. But on the other hand, I have other years that are much richer of cash. For example, these ones. Or for example, these ones. At the end of the project, I can have a debt service cover ratio that is much higher than required. So when a project performs in this way, one possible solution could be to reduce the capital repayment of the first two years, moving from, let's say, 625 and 625 and 625 to this alternative solution. I reduce the first year of 50 basis points, 575, 575, and 6%. And I move what I used in these three years on the final years of repayment. Look, in this case, what, for example, the arranger of this loan has done. Again, this is the column of your interest. Obviously, you can see that the total amount, the sum, is 100, and it is obvious. You have to amortize completely the loan. But the interesting thing here is that I moved the capital repayment from the first three here on the last three years, increasing the amount of 6.50 uh, in, year, in uh, semester 14, 6.75 in semester 15, and 6.75 in semester 16. Look again at the debt service cover ratio. You will certainly experience a lower level of debt service cover ratio at the end. 158 has become 146. And again for the final semester. But 146 is absolutely comfortable because 146 is much higher than 1.30. On the other hand, in the first two years, you can easily see that starting from 132, 133, I arrived more or less at 140. 139 and 1.399. And, and this is absolutely acceptable by banks. This is exactly an application of the tailor-made schedule of repayment. Clear for all? So, uh, should, you, uh, uh, should you be asked in a final exam to, uh, because this, is, this can happen, to uh, calculate debt service cover ratio, and maybe a question can be, look at the debt service cover ratio. Are these cover ratios sufficient for you, com comfortable for you? If not, which solution can you envisage in order to improve the quality of the debt service cover ratio? One possibility is to move the capital repayment according to the level of available free cash flow. Very easy. Use a tailor-made instead of a very rigid uh, repayment schedule like this one. Clear for all? Quite easy. Hmm? Uh, the alternative is uh, uh, the alternative I show you that sometimes is used in some project finance transaction 
is uh, the method of repayment based on the so-called dedicated percentage. Hmm? Uh, the method of the dedicated percentage is very intuitive. And uh, uh, the idea is this one. Instead of uh, uh, comparing the value of the free cash flow with the value of uh, capital and interest, why not to invert the reasoning in this way? Suppose that your financial plan show you that the trend of the free cash flow will be as such. Okay? An alternative idea could be let's uh, stipulate with the banks an agreement according to which a certain percentage of the free cash flow every year will be dedicated to the repayment of capital and interest. Let's say, for example, that 70% of the free cash flow will be paid in terms of capital and interest. If it is in this way, I know that being this amount, the 100% amount of money available, I can stipulate with banks that an amount of 70 is dedicated every year to the payment of capital and interest. And so, if in this year, a weak year, a poor year of performance, the amount of cash available is 100%, you can easily see from the graph that the amount of money that will be dedicated to the repayment of capital and interest will be again 70%. But in absolute value, this amount will be much lower. It is very easy again. I don't know if it is clear. Uh, the idea is I include into the loan agreement a rule according to which I will calculate the free cash flow at the end of each year. I will apply to this free cash flow the dedicated percentage that has been agreed between banks and the sponsors, this amount will be the sum of capital and interest that will uh, be repaid in that year. Quite easy. Okay? Uh, there is an interesting application of the dedicated percentage because uh, we can easily demonstrate that the uh, dedicated percentage is uh, the inverse of the debt service cover ratio. Uh, you know that the debt service cover ratio is the ratio between the free cash flow relative to time t and capital and interest relative to time t. You know it from our past lecture. Now, invert the two terms of the equation. We can write that 1 divided over that service cover ratio is capital plus interest times T over free cash flow times T. It is very easy. Nothing changes. Okay? I have inverted the two terms of the equation. Now, call that service cover ratio 1 over that service cover ratio as DP percentage, where DP percentage is the dedicated percentage. Okay? You can rewrite this equation in this way. Dedicated percentage times free cash flow is exactly the sum of capital plus interest at time t. But dedicated percentage is exactly the inverse of the debt service cover ratio. So if you fix a minimum debt service cover ratio, you can simply include the debt service cover ratio inside the loan agreement and say, based on the minimum debt service cover ratio, the dedicated percentage that we want to get every year is 1 divided the debt service cover ratio that you have selected as a minimum level. OK? It's quite easy. Let's look at an example, just to give you an idea. I don't know if you got it. I repeat. I inverted the two terms of the equation. I relabeled 
one over that service cover ratio with its name, dedicated percentage. The multiplication between dedicated percentage time free cash flow time T returns exactly the sum of capital plus interest at the end of year number T. Okay? Now, uh, let's have a look uh, at one simple example. Again, this is an example you have in your material, so you can simply follow on the screen. The relevant variable for you in this case is uh, the dedicated percentage. The dedicated percentage is 70%. 70% uh, is the inverse of the debt service cover ratio. Uh, look uh, at this part of your exhibit. Look at the debt service cover ratios. The value of the debt service cover ratio is always constant and it is obvious. Look, the debt service cover ratio will tell you that the distance between these values and this value is always constant. It is always 30%. So if you fix a minimum required dedicated percentage by this way, you are also negotiating the minimum debt service cover ratio that will be assured every year of operation. Because if you look at the graph, the distance between these two curves is always constant. Okay? You can interpret the 30% as the debt service cover ratio. Look again and try to answer to my question. If you look at this uh, exhibit, uh, which is the semester where the loan is completely repaid, where the outstanding debt falls to zero? Look again. The debt outstanding falls to zero at, the, at semester number 16. So it is exactly as in the previous example. In the previous example, we amortized completely in 16 semesters, eight years. Now, uh, I can calculate it very easily with a calculator, but I want you to reason on this. Suppose that the dedicated percentage passes from 70% to 60%. So the sponsors say, hey bank, I don't want to pay you no more than 60% of the free cash flow every year. 40% I, uh, I want to sweep out the remaining 40%. In your opinion, the amount of semesters uh, that are necessary in order to fully repay the loan will be longer or shorter? Longer, obviously. Uh, the lower the amount of dedicated percentage, the lower the amount of cash available for repayment, the longer the time period required for the loan repayment. It is very easy. Uh, let's, let's calculate it. Let's, for example, use a dedicated percentage of 60 and let's see what's happened. Again, look at the number of semesters that are necessary in order to repay the loan. We have arrived at the 21st semester and it is obvious. It is obvious because uh, I have used a lower amount of funds in order to pay back the banks. Instead of using 70% of the flows, I used only 60%, okay? But look at the value of the debt service cover ratio. The debt service cover ratio, if I use the dedicated percentage that is lower, will be higher or lower than before? Higher, for sure. I want to have a higher difference between the free cash flow and the debt service. That's obvious, okay? Let's return back on the 70%, because maybe one of the standard exercises that can be required to one of you during the exam is show me the schedule repayment using the dedicated percentage. It is quite obvious. Uh, let's get back to the 70%. I'm declaring too much, actually. Okay, again, we are on the 16th semester. Now, Suppose that we are interested in calculating the first row. And so, how the calculator calculates the first row. So, the amount of interest that are paid, 
the principal that is paid and the outstanding amount at the end of the first year. It is very easy uh, if you think correctly. Uh, since the free cash flow is the base for the calculation, let's use uh, the free cash flow from year number one. The free cash flow from year number one is this value, 131.67. So I can use this amount, free cash flow, as 131.67. Suppose that banks and sponsors have agreed on a dedicated percentage of 70%. So 70% will be the sum of capital and the interest that will be repaid in that year. So 70% returns the value of K plus I in that year. And you can see the debt service column whose value is 92.17. You can see this value, 92.17. Pay attention to one fact. 92.17 is the sum of the reimbursement and interest. So our problem now is to split this amount into the two basic components, the interest and capital repayment. How to do it? It is very simple. Interest we must keep in mind that interest is calculated on the outstanding amount of the previous year or previous semesters times the interest rate. Okay? And so, if the interest is in the first period, the outstanding debt is 1,000, I can use 1,000 times the time. Here we are talking of semesters. And so, you see, it is 6 twelfth, or 1 half, if you want, because we are talking about half an year. So, 6 twelfth times the interest rate that is available for the first semester. And so, 7.45. You can see the interest in this column. It is exactly this column. Okay? 7.45 so 7.45% times 1000 times one half returns us the value of the interest for the first semester whose value is 37.25 now it is quite easy to calculate the amount of principal repaid because I know the sum of capital and interest. I know the value of interest. By difference, I can calculate uh, the amount that is repaid. It is exactly what we did for the value added tax facility. Okay? Hi, K is exactly the value you see under the column loan repaid 5492. 54 point. 92. And obviously, guys, the outstanding amount at the beginning of uh, period number two and of period number one will be the difference between 1,000 and the repaid loan, 54.92. And so, 945.08. That will be the amount that we will have to use for the calculation of interest for the second semester. Quite easy. Okay? Sufficiently clear for all? Uh, if you want, I can uh, send you this file. But I prefer you to elaborate your own Excel file applying uh, this algorithm of calculation. Try it. If you are not able to get the result, and I'm sure you will be, uh, tell me and I can send you this. It is very simple. Okay? So, uh, I think that if uh, there is any question, any doubt? Okay, I think we can stop for today. Uh, let's close it. Tomorrow morning, uh, we will see two more topics. 